Greetings. I hope and trust. I find well, my dear friends, and welcome back to our lesson study. And we're looking at lesson number seven. What you did unto the least of these, unto the least of these. We are finding Christ at the time of judgment. And he paints the picture on what shall become of those who shall present themselves to be judged and hopefully admitted into eternal life. Before we go into this study, why don't we start with a word of prayer? Let us pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege of calling your name. Dear Lord, as we go through this study, we are mindful of the realities that there is much that is expected of us while we are on earth, and judgment is real. Dear Lord, we look forward to the second coming, and we wish to be informed by this study. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask, Amen. The broader theme that we're looking at is managing for the Master till He comes. And the picture that we're having as we are looking at the title of our subtopic, under the list of these, this has the ring of uh, a performance review of some sort, where we have Christ identifying our key result areas. What are the key performance indicators of the managers? And these are instructive in the sense that they affect our judgment and how we shall stand in that day. Just allow me to read the concluding remarks that are given and an extraction from the book Desire of Ages. This is what the author quotes. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory... And all the angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. Thus Christ on the Mount of Olives pictured to his disciples the scene of the great judgment day. And he represented its decision as turning upon one point. When the nations are gathered before him, there will be but two classes. And their eternal destiny will be determined by what they have done or have neglected to do for him in the person of the poor and the suffering. This is from the book Desire of Ages, page 637. It is instructive. To appreciate that, our destiny will be determined on what we would have done or neglected to do for him, and this will be in respect of the poor. So as we go into this study, we want to appreciate that this performance is going to be appraised based on what we would have done. So as we look at the memory text, what does the memory text then speak to? The memory text amplifies this um, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. In the New King James Version, it provides as follows. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So this is where there is admission into the kingdom that is prepared from the foundation of the world. And what is the issue that is the determinant, the point on which it turns, what you have done, or if you're not to be admitted, it is based on what you have not done. What would you have not done? So they are the poor that we must minister to, where Christ says, you saw me naked and you did not clothe me. You saw me hungry, you did not give me food. You saw me thirsty, you did not give me water. I was imprisoned, but you never visited me. All these are issues that Christ identifies as indicators for the managers of God to go into. So when we now look at going out to minister unto those who are less privileged than we are, there is this um, concept that we find in uh, business language. It's called CSR. That means Corporate Social Responsibility. So Christ is speaking to his managers in essence, let's use a bit of business language here, about corporate social responsibility. And he says, unless you engage in corporate social responsibility, 
as an entity, you are not going to make it. But above all, as an individual, you, each of us has a social responsibility. And what does social responsibility mean in essence? Let's just take it from business and then apply it into the Word of God. There are basically four indicators that one would look at if you go into social responsibility for you to be active. The first one would be environmental responsibility. Secondly, ethical responsibility. Thirdly, philanthropic responsibility. And number four, you'd be looking at financial responsibility. So a corporate that goes into social responsibility, what it does is it increases its brand. And not only does it increase its brand, customers begin to identify with this company because of the good that it brings into the community. So people will not just go to a company because it produces quality products, but they would identify with the company because of the benefit that they are deriving immediately. So as Christ is talking to his managers, I hear him to say, you are supposed to manage the brand of Christianity. If people are going to value Christianity, follow Christianity, and make sure that they become loyal to the brand of Christianity, there is a need for us to engage in social responsibility. When we come to an evaluation exercise and your performance is to be assessed as an individual manager, before we go to a corporate entity, individually as a manager, the question would be, what engagement did you partake in as far as social responsibility is concerned? How did you grow this brand? The brand called Christianity. How did people come to appreciate it and say, definitely we need to be Christian and we're going to follow this particular brand? So when we get that right, we definitely put Christianity on the top shelf. It moves to the top shelf. So Christ is speaking to his disciples now coming back to the managers. And he says, helping the poor is not optional. It is not optional. This is actually the essence of the gospel. We do not just help the poor because it's, it's among some of the things, other deliverables that we have to cover. This is the mission of Christianity. We exist to do these things. Now, let's look at um, Luke chapter 4 from verse 16 up to 19. Uh, allow me to quickly read this because these are the words of Christ. I wish for us to glean some lessons from them. Verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. We love verse 16, and we usually end there. He went to the synagogue as his custom was on the Sabbath. But Christ goes on to articulate his mission. Verse 17, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Now, when Christ is preaching to the church, his home church, he articulates his mission not just his corporate social responsibility to say, when we have done all our main business, how do we then plow back into the community? We're finding Christ going back into his native community. But as he gets there, the issue is not about plowing back, like in the literal corporate social responsibility strategy. We are plowing back into the community. Christ is saying, as Christians, our duty is not to plow back into the community. Our mission is to make an impact in the community. This is our mission, not our corporate social responsibility, which comes after we've achieved our mission. No, 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 no. It predates that. And his mission in this case, notice that it ministers unto the poor. It ministers unto those who are downtrodden. It ministers unto those who have no sight, those who are bruised, 
That is the mission of Christ. And it ought to be the mission of every Christian to go about and bring about this change. And, you, you know, I'm, I'm going to look at um, later on the, the, the assumptions that are being made as we go into this strategy. The assumption is that you can do something about it. The assumption is that we have already been enabled to attend to these things. So God is not giving us these things um, to say, go on um, um, an adventure and, and figure out whether you are able to deliver at this level. No, 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 no. It, it is a foregone conclusion. We are already equipped to that level. We are already equipped to that level. So this is now what is expected of us, to deliver at that level. And James 1 verse 27 gives this clarity. You know, maybe just in case we have not understood why in Matthew 25, those who do not do these things are told, depart from me, ye doers of iniquity. Now, this is a standard of purity. It is a standard of an undefiled religion. Now, look, look at uh, James 1 verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. One, to visit orphans. And two, widows in their trouble. Three, and to keep oneself unsported from the world. That's pure and true religion. So the assumption is, if you have not done anything towards the orphans, nothing towards the widows, and you have not kept yourself blameless, untainted, unsported by the world, if you have not done so, your religion is not pure, then you're not worth saving. You're not worth saving. Now, the, the other issue that we need to appreciate is when we come to dealing with the poor, it is not optional. It is mandatory. It is commanded of us that we must deal with these poor. In the Levitical period, this was the, the practice. When someone went into his or her field, they would have to harvest, but not to harvest everything. You had to leave a portion for the poor to come and clean and survive from the remains from your field, of course. Now, when we get to Deuteronomy, the second law, now Moses is talking to the children of Israel. He says, you shall always have the poor amongst you. Because of that, you shall not withhold. Always keep your hand open so they can receive from your hand. Maybe let me just read this. It's Deuteronomy 15 verse 11. I, lo I love the way it sounds in the Bible. For the poor shall not cease out of the land. Therefore, I command thee. I'll take that again. I command thee. What is the command? Saying, thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. You shall open your hand wide. So in the first scenario, the poor is supposed to pick up for him or herself. So we must contextualize this. Some of us would say, I don't have a field. I don't go out harvesting. No, 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 that's not the point. The point is, the principle is, number one, God has commanded. And now contextualize the command. When you have an opportunity to facilitate for the poor, for the needy, for your brethren, to earn a living and survive, put up means and systems for them to be able to pick up and make ends meet. That remains the principle. And secondly, for some of them, it is not about availing opportunities or, you know, systems that will enable them. For some of them, you need to be benevolent enough to hand these things out to them. Just like Job. You know, Job says, the Bible says, he went on to investigate to find out if there were any who were poor and needy. And he gave. He gave. He says, you know what? Because I gave the blessings that were due to them, they came to me. It is a blessed thing to give. So when we do that, these acts of benevolence, they definitely improve our walk with God. But above all, they improve our relations in the society and they represent God aright. They represent God aright. So when we're looking at these issues, we'll then, then come to an understanding that the social responsibility that we have 
has to do with setting up systems for the poor to survive. Have to do with not only setting up these systems for the poor to survive, but also going an extra mile of actually being the ones to hand out, hand out this aid. And here are some of the things that uh, you're going to find interesting. Let's use a bit of, um, you know, business language again, back to business. Um, clothe it with a bit of um, verses there. Proverbs 28 verse 27. He who gives to the poor will not lack. What is this? This is a guarantee. It's a cashback plan. You know, I'm sure you've watched those um, commercials where you're told if you subscribe to this insurance scheme and you do not claim after so long, you're going to get your cash back. So God is saying you have a cashback plan whenever you invest in the plan of taking care of the poor, the needy, the orphans, the widows. When you do so, you are guaranteed of your cash back. Secondly, he does not end there. Go to Proverbs 29, 29 verse 14. The king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. Let me go to the next one so that I just do a comparison. You will love this. Now let's look at Psalm 41 verse 1. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Now let us compare these two. The first one looking at a king who is on a throne. If you judge the poor with truth, your throne will be established. When one is a king, it is expected that he wants to have a throne that will be established. It is expected. Now, secondly, you have a scenario where if you consider the poor, the Lord will deliver you in times of trouble. When is your time of trouble? We do not know. So it is an uncertain period. It is unknown. So where you have something that is known, in business language, you take an assurance policy. Where you have something that is unknown and uncertain, you take an insurance policy. So death, death is sure. If the Lord doesn't come, it's sure. Then we take a life assurance policy where you say, in the event of my death, I want to be guaranteed for maybe, let's say, 50,000 US dollars. So that is a life assurance policy. But when you're driving your automobile, you're driving your car, you do not know when you're going to be involved in an accident. So you take a what? An accident insurance. So God uses the same principle. And he says, when you come into this partnership of dealing with the poor, I'm giving you a life assurance. Your position is going to be established. When you lend to the poor, I'm giving you a life insurance. In the times of trouble, I will definitely visit you and I will deal kindly with you. You know, I, 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 love, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. And two people were given an opportunity to come through and exercise this particular provision. And the two persons that we are finding in the New Testament, the first one is the rich young ruler. The second one is Zacchaeus, the tax collector. What happens is the rich young ruler comes to Christ and he says, Master, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? What shall I do? He goes on to say, you keep the commandments, you do one, two, three, blah, 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 blah. And he says, I've kept these from the days of my youth. And the master says, but you lack one thing. One thing thou lackest. Go and sell all, all your riches and then come and follow me. The Bible says the young man left that place sorrowful and disappointed. And he was never heard from again. Why? Because he was told, go and sell all that you have and then come and follow me. This was a difficult ask for him, a difficult ask for him. And now faced with the probability of following Christ up close as one of his apostles, riches stood between him and this offer. He would not accept it if it meant parting with his riches for the sake of the poor. Flip to the second character. We're looking at Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, just like the rich young ruler, goes seeking after Christ. You know, the rich young ruler just accesses Christ. And it's easy, you know, when you are, you are a person of reckon, it becomes easy for you to access certain places. You know, without much struggle, he's there. But Zacchaeus, in spite of his riches, he has these other two limitations. A physical limitation and a social one. The physical limitation is that he's a man of little stature. He's short, so he has to climb up the sycamore tree. 
The second limitation is that as far as the public opinion is concerned, he does not weigh too much. They do not think highly of him because he's a tax collector and therefore he's branded as a sinner. And having been branded as a sinner, Christ then sees him up there and he says, I'm here to dine with you. Come down, I'm headed to your house. And uh, they head off to the house. We do not hear the discussion. But this unrecorded encounter, in terms of what then went on when they got to the house, what we get to hear is that Zacchaeus then stands up and says, of all my riches, of all that I own, 50% of it I'm giving it to the poor. And if ever there is anyone I've defrauded, I'm paying back four times. That which I've defrauded this person. And Jesus responds and says, salvation has come unto your house. He too is the son of Abraham. You know, we, we, we are quick to make this assumption that some people are beyond saving. Some people, especially who work for oppressive regimes, cannot be moving with the Lord. And therefore, we write them off and say, these ones are not candidates for salvation. But Jesus says, he too is the son of Abraham. Now, notice what happens here. What distinguishes these two? Zacchaeus offers 50% of his portion to the poor without being called upon to do it. The young man, in spite of having uh, kept the commandments, but when the issue of offering to the poor came up, he would not, he would not tolerate it. And secondly, he did not even broach the subject on his own. So when 100% was demanded from him, he chose to retain his 100% and lose a relationship with the Savior. But as far as Zacchaeus is concerned, he offers 50% on his own and he is commended for that. God does not say, no, 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 let's apply the rule of precedence. As far as the rich young man ruler, the rich young ruler is concerned, I demanded 100%. Why should I accept 50% from you? But because he has given out of his volition, out of the goodness of his heart, God looks at that, Christ looks at that and says, salvation has come to unto, unto thy house. So salvation has to do with the natural response that we make towards God. When we have had an encounter with Christ, it shall become natural for us to give. Because some of us have a head knowledge, but we lack a heart knowledge. With a head knowledge, we will know the law. With a head knowledge, we will keep the law. But without a heart knowledge, we will never act on the law. So what Zacchaeus does, having met Christ, he then goes into a heart action. He responds by applying the law, contextualizing it and applying it. What is the spirit of the law? To liberate those who are bruised. What is the spirit of the law? To defend those who are suffering injustice. So God has capacitated us like the Zacchaeus. He has capacitated us like the young rich ruler. We have these in our, in, in our hands. And the issue is, what are we doing about them? What are we doing about them? And um, rightly so. There are some who always claim, you know, this story is about the rich young ruler. This story is about Zacchaeus. He was a rich tax collector. I am not at that level. And there is no way God would be expecting me to do anything because surely I am in Africa. I am not out there. You know, there was a time around uh, 2008, thereabout, at Solus University, we're having a tough time. It was during the meltdown of the Zimbabwean economy. And we had students from Andros University collect an offering where they donated money. And we queued up in the vice chancellor's office to receive these um, donations, alms of about $10 each that were coming in from the United States of America, from students at Andros University. May God bless them out there. Now, $10 made a difference for us in 2008. Today, I have $10. I have $10. It's a decade later. I have $10. Is there someone else I can give $10 today and they will bless the Lord and say, the Lord is good. I received $10 in 2008. I thanked the Lord. But today, I have $10. I claim to be still poor. I cannot pass it on when I received $10 from a student and I thanked the Lord. This is the challenge I want to give us. Let's not think about the rich young ruler as the only one who should give. Because many of us have classified ourselves as poor for life, so as to make the excuse never to give. 
That's how we've classified ourselves. But then when we want to act up and play with the Joneses, we wear the labels and we want to appear rich. But when we have to actually behave rich, we'd rather not, or rather behave poor when we have to give. And, and, and this is deplorable. It, it, it is very embarrassing, really. It is embarrassing. And, and, and I speak more to myself. I speak more to myself. I'm not poor. I'm not. I am rich. I am rich relatively. I'm richer than someone. You will not, you will not always be the poorest. There is a period where in life you're going to find yourself richer than the next person. Even amongst the poor, you are always richer than someone else. And, and, and this is what the lesson is basically saying. What did you do for that person that you are richer than? Not that you are the richest. You are not necessarily the richest, but there is always someone that you are richer than. What have you done? When we do this, this is pure and undefiled religion. It's, it's so easy to demand this of our churches, regardless of which church you go to. It's so easy to demand this. But look at the characters that we have looked at. The rich young man, Zacchaeus, and Job. These are individuals. And when we get to judgment, there is no corporate that appears at judgment. I'm a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We shall not appear there as churches. Seventh-day Adventists come here, you're being judged. Roman Catholics come in, Methodists come in, um, Pentecostal come in. No, 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 no. Baptists come in. No, it doesn't work that way. We appear as individuals. Individuals. Have you investigated the plight of those in your community and made a difference? Have you done that? Have you done that? And that difference need not be $1,000. $10 will make the difference. Even $5 will make the difference. Have you done that? Have you done that? You know, this is the challenge. And I, I, I want to leave it to us to say, my dear friends, you know, I, I, unless we get to a point where we take up this corporate social responsibility issue and say, Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in. The saints go marching in after judgment, my friends. And it turns on this one point. What you have done. Grace would not be enough for you to say, through the blood of Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. What have you done to lift up the brand of the name Jesus Christ? What have you done in the society to impact it for the kingdom? How many through your arms have come through and said, had it not been for Tabitha, would not have known that there is prayer? Because they call upon Peter to say, come and resurrect Tabitha. Why? Because had good deeds led them to a life of prayer. A life of prayer that is divorced from good deeds does not help in social responsibility. Unto the list of these. Unto the list of these. Next week, we want to look at how to become successful. I invite you to call again as we are going to roll over to lesson number eight. Until then, blessings and peace. Thank you.